so that we'll be saved. Yeah. Um, it's like a life to life exchange, like a ransom. So Jesus was a ransom for us. Uh, Jesus gave his life, laid down his life in exchange for our lives. Yeah. Another um, adjective that we cannot, like when we describe Jesus, we describe him in, in two terms and none of them, like uh, not one of them can be missing. Uh, if one is missing, then we miss the whole point. So um, it has to be Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, our Savior is true. Jesus, our Lord is true. But it must be in order to really um, capture the essence of who he is. We have to say Jesus, our Lord and Savior. What is the Lord? Um, for those people who have come from an Asian background, you know, I understand that um, the, the, the term does not give you a good feeling. Yeah, it's almost like an emperor, right? <laughs> emperor uh, does not give you a good feeling because it sounds kind of uh, like a, a powerful person actually having a grip over you and making you do the things that you are not willing to do. Um, those people who may be abusive with their positional powers but this is not the case. Our Lord is a good Lord. So, um, what is the Lord? Lord means a master. Yeah. So, master has servants. Yeah, so when we say Jesus is our Lord, we're acknowledging that um, in terms of our relationship, we are servants. So um, it's an imperfect illustration because like um, human beings always, we, we always have our selfish agendas and um, we're not completely nice to those people who are under us and things like that, right? But um, for the back, uh, lack of better illustration, we're going to talk about this um, thing called Lord and servant relationship, right? So uh, what does a Lord do? A Lord um, of a household, yeah, or a castle, so it, either way, right? What does he do? He... Um, is the the leader of the castle or the household he um, is probably good at managing he's very good at um, protecting he knows how to protect the the place the household and castle um, a lord over a castle probably is a warrior or has some military power has some soldiers under him so that the castle can be protected, right? Um, now, the Lord has servants, yeah? Servants actually do what the Lord says, right? Um, the Lord has a big picture. He knows the ins and outs of the castle and the life in, in, inside and outside of the castle, and he knows what needs to be done. So, in an ideal, ideal situation, right? So the Lord, actually uh, calls the head servants, right? Head servants who have been there for a while, who are knowledgeable, who are good-hearted, who are faithful, basically who are faithful. And he entrusts into their care you know, sometimes the Lord has to go away 
to take care of the businesses outside. He has to meet with other people. He has to maybe he has to meet with the king. Uh, maybe he has to meet. Um, I, I say he because most of the time in ancient history, the lords were mostly uh, men, right? So I'm not being um, like uh, you know I, I'm not being sexist right now, but rather um, just referring to the fact that most of the lords in the past were males, right? So I'm gonna call him he. So he goes away, and while he's gone away, like before he goes away, what does he do? He gathers his head servants who are faithful, who he trusts, okay? And uh, he actually basically gives uh, instructions, okay? This is what you're supposed to be doing. And uh, I'm gonna be back in about a month, um, or slightly longer, depending on the situation. But uh, by the time I come over, come back here, um, I want this and that and that and that having done, having completed um, the construction, like on this site, like a, I don't know, um, stuff like a, I want part of this uh, castle um, that is old and kind of weak um, to be uh, restored. Like you need to uh, take out the old um, bricks or old uh, pieces of rocks and then uh, replace them with new uh, plaster. Uh, I want you to fix the gates uh, because when the gates are weak, um, and then it's going to be easy for the enemies to invade. Um, you know what? I want this part of the storage to be clean. Um, I'm going to use it for a different purpose. Okay, so, and uh, by the way, um, we um, have so much wealth, but I want you to manage it in this and that and that way. Um, invest in here, leave it there, reserve there. Okay, don't spend any more than this, because I know that your uh, uh, average expenses are like this. So he's got his uh, finance guy, he's got his uh, military, you know, uh, leader guy, he has this, um, you know, housekeeping person. Um, you have the, these uh, skillful servants who are good at fixing the castles. So then he entrusts into each person's care, um, what what needs to be done and then the servants go yes sir right yes sir um, by the time you come back we will have uh, done it now when the lord comes back um, the servants have better <laughs> that they had better have accomplished all the things that were that they were told to do right because um, Servants, um, by status, they are supposed to listen to the Lord, and they are supposed to um, actually follow the instructions, and that's why they are there. If they don't follow instructions, they should be fired, right? They're not servants anymore. servants while they're faithful and if they turn out to be unfaithful say the Lord comes back the master comes back and the things were not accomplished or uh, they actually built their own kingdom like say uh, they stole the uh, lower status servants just because the Lord is away and um, they have this month uh, they build special relationship with like um, the servants underneath and some of them probably struggle because okay i should be loyal to the master and why are you saying that i my loyalty should be toward you like you are a head servant you're not the master you know some people um, struggle with that and then this head servant gets rid of them you know okay then you're fired okay i'll let you go and they're like what are you going to say when the master comes back well we'll think about it then <laughs> So he builds his own group of people who are loyal to him and he does do what the master actually told him to do. And um, finally, yes, the master comes back. The Lord comes back uh, a month and a half later. What happens? The Lord will say, um, we're missing some people here. Okay, where are these people uh, who have uh, 
who are supposed to be serving in the kitchen. Uh, some of them are missing, okay? Uh, you you are supposed to have them clean up the store. It's like, oh, where are they? And this unfaithful head, uh, head servant would say, um, you know, excuses, excuses, lies and lies. The Lord will eventually find out, okay, this is what you have done. You didn't do, you listened, you hear, you heard. I want to I want to use the word hear instead of listen because listening is being more attentive. Okay, you heard my instructions. You heard my word, but you did not do what it said. You're wicked. You and you you did the things according to your own selfish gain and your desires. That is so not right with me. That is so not okay with me. Okay? Now, um, your, uh, your wage, like I'm going to cut it in half because you did the wrong job. And today on, you're not my servant. Get out. Right? And so, um, that's going to happen. And then, um, say, the one who was fixing the castle, he was really faithful. And so he did everything according to the detailed instructions of the master or the Lord. Um, and he comes and he says, uh, Lord, uh, I am not very worthy, but I did my best uh, to, to really team up uh, the service under, underneath me. And uh, we actually fixed the, the exter uh, exterior, interior, uh, this, we cleaned up the storage. We actually uh, fixed the gates uh, so that your castle is in a much better shape than when you first left. What will the Lord say? He will say, good and faithful servant, you can join me for my banquet. And um, I will actually um, promote you because uh, you've been very faithful. I think I'm at peace when I leave this castle to take care of my business. Um, I think I can trust you. So um, I'm going to actually lift you up uh, to a higher position. So, and uh, by the way, you know, uh, I'm going to give you um, like a, a higher wage. I mean, servants, yeah, servants could have been paid, but uh, there are uh, servants who never get paid either, either too. So like, I'm just describing, you know, I'm just, just describing as paid servants. Uh, which may not have been the case, you know, in Jesus' times or before, right? Um, so, good and faithful servant, you know, I'm going to give you certain wealth and you can actually um, have your family celebrate your promotion. You know, uh, I'm going to give you fat and calf um, and uh, I'm going to actually announce your promotion um, to all the servants and all the uh, household members. And so... <laughs> Here, the Lordship, Lordship of Christ. Means that he's in charge, in charge. He's in charge. So, uh, this person who saved us, who gave us a means for salvation, and by the way, uh, say this person who comes to rescue, lay down his life, but then if the other person who needs to be rescued does not respond for, for whatever reason, does not grab onto the tube, does not get on the boat, um, does not, uh, you know, just fights back and, you know, I, I'd rather die in the water. Then the rescuer, the savior, cannot save us. Um, he cannot do anything about it. It's a voluntary choice. You have to stretch your hands, let him grab you, allow him to lift you up and put you on the boat. You have to allow that. If you just struggle and wrestle, fight back and you stay in the water, you're going to die. So, um... Having a safe 
Savior does not guarantee our salvation if we're not willing to uh, allow ourselves to be saved. Now, um, he's the Lord, so we need to hear his instructions and do what he says. So, therefore, in that context, um, James is saying, Disciple James is saying, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Yeah, do what it says. It sounds really blunt. It sounds really simple. But the process of following, um, it's also simple, but it's not easy because um, we have this inner tendency to want to do things on our own, like our way. Yeah. Sometimes that's not the wisest way, but we sometimes want to do the things that that, um, that we think we know better about. Um, and we oftentimes turn to the world, like check out, like Google everything, right? And check out statistics, uh, what the experts say, uh, what the professionals say. Then, to, uh, you know, take heed of their recommendation rather than uh, listening to our Lord who is the origin, who is the source of wisdom, all wisdom. Now, um, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what it looks like. So, We all uh, get up in the morning and look, we look into the mirror, right? Um, because you're taking online classes and I can't see you. Uh, maybe some of you have like uh, bad hair right now. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when we have like, physical classes, when you come to this class, then um, I surely see that most of you actually uh, grouped yourself a little bit. And although it's uh, early in the morning and you put on um, like decent, decent clothes, you know, not like your pajamas or like, uh, I don't know, you don't wear your swimsuits or uh, you don't wear your like, um, um, you know, homeware, you know, uh, to class, but rather you wear like something casual, but something decent, right? And so, and you tend to have a uh, brush your hair, you know, uh, have washed your face and things like that, right? And so um, we look at the mirror uh, for a couple of purposes, right? Um, because we want to know, sometimes, you know, well, teenagers are known for um, focusing on their, themselves, right? You know, they're very interested in how they look on the outside and they're very interested in other people's look on the outside too, right? And so uh, we look at the mirror sometimes just to enjoy, I guess, you know, oh, you know, um, I think I look decent or something like that. Oh, my, my parents have done, done a good job. Uh, but more often than that, we look into the mirror because uh, we want to see like what's wrong, right? Uh, is, is there any food on my cheek? Um, is there any, um, like, like is my hair kind of socially appropriate? Like if I go out like this, you know, no one really gets up from the bed unless it's an emergency, gets up from the bed and they just go out, you know, with their bed, he uh, you know, bed hair <laughs> and in their pajamas. They usually don't, right? Um, I've seen some people since, especially since uh, Corona, <laughs> um, if it's like seven o'clock in the morning, if I go outside, then um, I see some, um, the people who really could care less and they're in their pajamas and with their head hair, uh, bed hair. <laughs> But usually, people don't do that, right? People usually don't do that. At least they wear an, an overcoat. I mean, during the summer, you can't be done. But usually wear something over um, if you don't want to change your pajama right at that moment. And then do something about your hair, like, you know, like um, put some water, uh, lotion or whatever, and then you um, push your hair, and then you, you tend to go out, right? Um, but let's say a person who listen to a mirror and then he just walks away. I'm going to use the word he, um, uh, but it includes she as well. But he looks at the mirror and 
and then certainly, oh, you know, there are ghosts in his eyes. Um, he, his head, hair is just all over the place. And uh, uh, actually, like, uh, uh, like his pants, like, one side is like rolled up. And I don't know what he did in his uh, bed, but, you know, it's totally off. Right? And uh, he looks at the mirror. He did not fix anything. He walks away. He forgets the fact that he looks like he, he would, the first time he looked into the mirror, he was like, ah, who is this monster? Right? Uh, but he didn't do anything about it. He didn't do anything. Uh, and then he walked away. He walked outside. Oh, his girlfriend decided to drop off something. And, uh, well, she hasn't seen him in that uh, condition before. And so she's like, she drops. She literally drops <laughs> the things that she wanted to drop off. And she, her, her like mouth is wide open and she's like, I do not want to meet this person ever again. And she runs out. How about that? Okay. So um, anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his, his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away without fixing and immediately forgets what it looks like. Yeah, that's, that's one interpretation. Like that's my kind of um, uh, embellished interpretation of this passage. But it's like that. What is the purpose of the mirror? So that you can reflect on yourself and fix whatever is wrong. You want to look better. What, why, why do people in the ancient times, even you come up with this like copper, copper mirror or you know whatever the uh, steel mirror. mirror. Uh, why did they look at look at themselves uh, on the reflection on the, on the water and things like that? It's because they wanted to see how they look and they wanted to look better, right? Um, so then, if we hear the word of God say, God says. Um, you know, uh, you need to spend more time with me. Okay? Uh, come away, my beloved. Come and enjoy the time with me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, um, He's inviting. And if we don't respond to it, that's hearing, but not doing what it says. Right? Then He's not the Lord anymore. It's not, well, I've, um, I'm also reminded of this uh, situation. I, I think uh, some of you actually watch like K-dramas and some of the K-dramas actually have, uh, they depict the ancient times, like Joseon Dynasty, Korea Dynasty, you know, the dynasties of uh, hundreds of years ago, right? And in those uh, societies, they actually had um, hierarchical social structures where, um, you know, there, there were different levels of people, right? And so there were, uh, there, there was a class called Yangban, meaning um, they are the nobility, right? Um, they have certain, uh, so many years, so many um, centuries of family history, right? And so, so much of uh, positional power. And even if they have um, politically, uh, you know, they, they went down, downhill, or even um, they lost their wealth. Um, they, they often went together, position and wealth went together. And they, even if something happened and they went down because of their tradition, they had to live a noble life, um, right? And they had to have servants, right? And so the servants um, were at, uh, at a, they, they were treated like the servants. Um, and so the, the young man, master, you know, um, calls the servants, you know, say in the morning. So there are different kinds of servants, right? And uh, it, it, there used to be different kinds of servants in Korean history. And I'm pretty sure that was true in other Asian countries as well. And um, perhaps in European history too. Um, but there were those who uh, were supposed to provide, you know, they, they're supposed to get up really early before the sun comes up and they're waiting 
outside of these uh, sliding doors, right? Um, even in the cold, right? During the winter, they have to get up and prepare, and they actually have to uh, warm, uh, uh, prepare their their master's shoes, and oftentimes they have to warm it, warm them up. So when the master gets up, he will not have to put on the um, cold shoes, and they also have prepared uh, like a glass of water, like a bowl of water, you know, and so that the, when the master gets up. That he doesn't have to look for water, but rather, you know, he can drink the water, or maybe they have prepared the tea. I don't know. Yeah, and certainly there are servants who are preparing his breakfast, right? Now, um, and um, on this particular day, the master was supposed to um, go outside to take care of uh, some special business. And so he gave, he had given uh, certain instructions to his servants the night before or the day before, right? Um, all right, so I'm going out and looks like, the sky looks like it's going to rain tomorrow, so prepare an umbrella. And I don't even have to say it, and you know, faithful servants should know, right? And, um, you know, I, uh, do you remember what I wrote, the letter? I need to actually meet with this person instead of a, because it's such a, uh, like a um, high, high classified, uh, highly classified uh, letter I have to hand carry, like rather than you know sending a courier, um, I am going to actually meet with this person, and I have to show him. I have to show him this letter. Do you remember that letter? Bring it and uh, bring it tomorrow morning, the first thing in the morning. Okay. So this master got up, and the servant who was supposed to bring that document, he gets up. You know, he coughs, you know, to, to let people know that he's awake, right? And uh, he goes like, all right, um, even before breakfast, I need to go out and meet this person, you know, and bring me the document, bring me that letter. And then the servant is like, oh, master, oh, my family is having a breakfast right now. Can you please wait for 30 minutes? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen to the servant? The master is not going to allow that. He's not going to wait 30 minutes. Okay, finish your breakfast first. Uh, let me wait for you. That doesn't happen. It's going to be like, what did you say? Say that again. Um, and then if it goes like, oh, please allow us 30 minutes to have breakfast and I'll bring the, the, the letter to you. It's like five o'clock in the morning. Why? Why is it? What's in a hurry? Then that servant is let go. Like, you're not my servant anymore. Like, get out with your entire family, right? And so, um, when we say that Jesus is Lord and Savior, He saved us. Well, He's not a demand anymore. He's not saying, well, since I've saved you your life, uh, your eternal life, uh, you better do what I say. No, He's not doing that. He's a good Lord. He, uh, the reason He gives us certain instructions through, uh, through the scriptures is because that's the path of blessing. mention the fact that um, the Bible is worth checking out um, because, well, for several reasons, right? Because it's one of the best sellers ever for the past uh, few centuries uh, throughout human history, probably. And then number two is because um, it has a lot of uh, uh, wisdom and understanding of those wise people um, who, have, who are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Number three, it, it, it you know, lays out the cultural, historical um, aspects, you know, the, the, the history of the Israelites, which is worth um, checking out. You know, it has an, an anthropological, sociological, um, you know, uh, values, cultural values. Uh, but 
Even more immediately important to us is that because the Bible actually teaches us the ways, the path to blessings and the path to curses. Yeah. And um, our Lord is a good Lord. He wants all of us to be blessed. And He knows exactly how we will be blessed because He's the one who gives all the blessings. By being with Him, by connecting with Him, by staying with Him, we receive blessings. We don't seek the Lord and blessings. No. When we seek the Lord, then we are blessed. So therefore, seek the Lord so that you can be blessed. And so, although this passage may sound like commanding, like you need to, you need to really listen, hear the word, and actually do it. You need to do it. You know, it sounds uh, like an obligation, like uh, 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 you know, requiring a duty. Like it, it sounds like uh, duty. Uh, you know, uh, you need to do this out of sense of duty kind of thing, right? It sounds kind of compulsory, but actually it's not. Um, the Lord sometimes gives us um, pretty cle uh, clear, simple, direct, kind of blunt instructions because He really wants us to obey. He really wants us to do the Word, uh, uh, be the doers of the Word. The reason is because He wants us to be blessed, right? Uh, because there are natural and spiritual consequences uh, when we go against Him. When we hear the Word and not do it. Say, um, let me give you a big example. Um, there are two sons, okay? The parents are there, Asian parents, and there are two sons. And Jesus actually um, gave this parable. He said, okay, now um, go out to the field and do this and do that. And uh, the first son, uh, first son says, um, yes, I will do it. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting which order, but let's say the first son, um, yes, yes, I will do it. And then um, he does not go out to the field. Now the second son said, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure if I really feel like doing it, daddy. But actually, um, although he was reluctant, he actually goes out and to the field and does what, what the Father says. Which one do you think is obedient? Which one do you think loves the Father? The latter, right? Uh, the, the son who might not say, yes sir, you know, I'll do it immediately. But the first son, in, in his case, I will do it. He, he heard it and even responded, but then he never put it into practice. Um, his father is not honored. He doesn't love the father. The one, the son who loves the father, uh, may not feel like it, but and, and did not really say like enthusiastically, oh yes, I will do it immediately. But eventually he goes out and actually does the father's will. Um, he certainly loves the father. And after like the pattern of the same thing, thing behaviors, happen over and over again, what do you think is going to happen? The relationship between the father and the actual disobedient son is going to uh, kind of fall apart, right? And over time, uh, this son who obeys the father's instructions, um, the relationship is going to get grow better. Um, and the father, even if his favorite was, and he actually banked on, and he wanted, and he was really hoping and dreaming that the first one would turn out to be um, really his uh, son that will inherit all his inheritances and you know take good care of the household and all the family and relatives. If the other child actually uh, is more responsible, is faithful, and he can be, he is trustworthy, then what do you think is going to ha happen in the end? Is that um, the father is going to entrust into his care more responsibilities, like something more important. Because this son, uh, he knows he's going to do, like even if father passes away, he knows that this son is going to do what, what his father said, right? And so, um, 
Then this son who actually heard the instructions and put it into practice, he, he actually did what the father said. It is to his blessings because he's loved by the father, he's trusted by the father, and um, actually he's going to inherit his inheritances because the father believes that this child is going to actually take better care of the family and the entire household. I think he's going to keep our tradition. I think he's going to do good for the relatives, for our entire clan. I think he is more promising. So then um, God is telling us, I want all of you to be that son who actually hears and does the word of mine and receive blessings. Let me read this again for you. James chapter 1, verse 23. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what it looks like. Verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. Once again, they will be blessed in what they do. So when the blessings include uh, just uh, uh, having good fruits and good results in whatever they put their hands to. Yeah, uh, because they are trusted and God blesses them. So wherever they go, they are blessed. So um, it's not like they have to go somewhere and create blessings. But where they go, because God's favor is upon them, uh, it'll, it'll become prosperous. Okay, now I want to focus on uh, verse 25. Well, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, the same thing. Whoever looks into the law of God is the word of God. Who hear the word of God and do what it says will be blessed in what they do. But um, particularly it says the perfect law that gives freedom. Yeah, law gives freedom. Law sounds really bound, binding. It sounds limiting. And um, sometimes it feels like it, I understand. Um, it does seem to limit people's um, behaviors, boundaries, but ultimately it, it is the law of God. It's different than the laws of uh, the state or, you know, uh, it's not like human laws, okay? God's laws, although it may sound, because uh, we, we kind of react to the laws, you know, it sounds really choking, uh, you know, it, it sounds limiting. However, the laws of God um, sets us free. What does it set us free from? So, um, who is not free? There are people who are free, and there are people who are not free. Is that true? So, uh, who are free? Um, well, you and me, you know, kind of free. We walk around free, and we go to the places that we want to go to, and uh, nobody keeps us from, uh, you know, doing the things that we do, right? Um, but there are people who are not free. Those people who are imprisoned, um, those people who are, um, you know, homebound, those people um, say in the uh, old times, right? The slaves, the slaves were in bondages, you know, they were not free. And so uh, let's go back to slavery. So um, back to the illustration of the Israelites. The Israelites, um, if you read um, 
the book of Exodus, right? Then you can actually see that the Israelites have been um, in bondages, in slavery for a long time. Um, they were slaves to a great kingdom called Egypt. And yes, back in those days, Egypt was great. And uh, the Egyptians actually made them work um, day and night. Uh, they were not considered as human beings. They were, there were not such a thing as uh, human rights and no fair wages, no, no wages. Okay, if they were given money, then it was uh, less than what they needed to, for their families to survive. So they would just randomly pick. I mean, they could take away your daughters uh, and make them servants. They could take away your young sons and put them into slavery. They, were, they had to do like backbreaking job uh, from early morning till night until they would collapse to death, right? Uh, they had to make bricks, uh, carry the bricks, and, um, and their bricks were very heavy, heavy. And you had to build precisely according to the plan um, and all the pyramids and um, buildings, these built like even um, to today's uh, eyes, like um, you know, modernist eyes, it, it they all look uh, incredible. Sphinx, you know, um, you know, like pyramids and all the buildings, you know, um, palaces. How did they? How did they? Without the proper technology of today, like how did they build these? Now, how, how are they lasting so long? Okay, well, we don't know exactly what they did, but um, we know what we know for sure is that it took, it costs it, it cost many lives um, of the Israelites. They actually were, were in uh, slavery and they were they worked to death. And so then they started crying out to God, Yahweh, um, the only God, um, and they said, you know, please, please rescue us from this slavery because this is not a life. Um, it's every day is a torture and uh, we have no hope and no dreams. Please send us a rescuer. And God did um, symbolically, uh, well, he was a practical leader, a real leader, but he was a, a foreshadow. It was like a kind of a symbolic figure that referred to the Messiah to come and his name was Moses, um, the Hebrew slaves, right? Hebrew slaves were crying out to the Lord and God um, actually answered by sending Moses. Now, um, because we are not living in a society where um, we have like slaves and servants, um, it may not come across to us really closely. It's, well, slavery, okay, well, I'm not sure how it was like I, I see in the movies and K-dramas, but that's all, right? However, there is something called spiritual bondages. Spiritual slavery, I would say. So we're walking around free, but do you remember Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden that we talked about um, a few sessions ago, right? Um, in the Garden of Eden, um, Adam and Eve were just walking around like just like and a child would feel so happy, you know, like they were running around, they were just happy, picking from any trees except one tree, right? And they were just enjoying the perfect love that came from God, right? And God was actually walking in the Garden of Eden. Isn't that incredible? He shrank himself and came to the earth. Uh, now, um, Adam and Eve uh, went against God. They exercised their free will to choose Satan, the one who opposes God, rather than God himself. And so as a result, the sin and death, shame and guilt and blame, sickness, jealousy, violence and death, all came into the picture, all came into the Garden of Eden. And um, 
So from then on, they were not immune to these evil, this evil that came into the Garden of Eden. They couldn't hide themselves. They couldn't run away from it. Um, they had to deal. They had to daily face the evil. And um, if you remember, Cain and Abel, um, Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain first. Uh, with the help of God, I um, gave birth to son. But unfortunately, he turned out to be uh, uh, very much a violent and rebellious person, right? He had a younger son called Abel. And uh, uh, because Abel's offering was offered up to God, he brought the best thing that he ever had, the firstborn of his livestock, and uh, he offered it with all his heart by faith. Versus uh, Cain offered to God some casual offering. He gathered some grains and he was like, okay, here. And so God looked at Abel's um, worship, his offerings, with more favor. And Cain could not handle it. Although he knows exactly what, why Abel's offerings were accepted and his offerings were not accepted with favor, he knew the reason, probably, but um, he was still angry. He still felt that God was not fair, and so um, what he did was that he called his um, younger son Abel, come out to the field, okay? And then um, Abel came out, and then he struck him to death. Now, more evil comes, comes in. You know, first murder already came out during the second generation of human history. And now, worse and worse sins are committed. And so, more and more evil comes into the world, and um, the Bible actually does not um, tell in detail, like it, it doesn't describe what happens to Cain afterwards, like he becomes a wanderer, but God actually put a cross on his uh, you know, forehead and uh, you know, put blessings and, uh, so that he would not be killed by, the, uh, by uh, other wanderers or other beings, right? Now, um, the Bible does not describe what happened to him afterwards, but then um, if he did not, it, he probably did not um, completely turn away to, to God, but rather kept sinning. Like if once a person keeps um, rebelling against God, breaking the laws, here the word God does not do it and does, does the opposite, you know, uh, listens to the one who opposes God. Uh, and put this practice, and then what happens is that you are uh, uh, you become enslaved into the uh, the cycle of sin, and so once you're bound by the enemy, because that's what what the enemy does. The enemy actually throws out a bait, and once you because it sounds so attractive and um, good and cool, right? Uh, actually, sounds better than God's commands, and so once you bite it, then he pulls you to his side really um, fast and strong and then if you uh, go deeper with that then he starts fighting you so that's a spiritual bondage and so spiritual slavery spiritual bondages uh, refer to that now um, god's word sets us free Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. So the law, the word of God, when we read the word of God, meditate on it. And at first, it's really hard to do, especially if, you're, uh, if you have bondages, then it's hard to do God's will. But with God on your side, if you really call out the name of God and ask the Holy Spirit to really help you. Um, oftentimes what happens is that in your um, intense time with the Lord. It's called worship. Time of worship. It could be corporate. It could be private. Um, when you spend time with God, when you immerse yourself in the presence of God. And it could take the form of singing praise songs. Um, remember, Satan is a fallen angel. He used to be an archangel uh, that was in charge of worship. So when we sing praise songs, it powerfully uh, destroys the kingdom of darkness. Yeah, he hates it. And then um, when we deeply meditate on the word of God, it actually does it, um, and uh, praise, uh, 
uh, pray, then, uh, then what happens is the bondages are broken off. Yeah, broken off. And you're set free. And you're, you feel more empowered to do God's will, to do God, um, put into practice God's word in your daily life. You're more empowered. So that's what it means by um, He set you free. The laws of God set us free. The laws of God actually um, gives us ideas as to how it should have been with the sin and darkness. And so we're like, oh, okay, so it's like when you are, when you have grown up in a dysfunctional family, you know, like an uh, abusive family or, you know, uh, a family probably perhaps without uh, violence, but then there are like unhealthy dynamics going on, right? Codependence or like um, manipulation is going on. If you have grown up, if you were born into the family and grew up there, then perhaps you are not self-aware. A lot of times, um, those people who have come from dysfunctional family backgrounds tend to al also create dysfunctions of their own when they procreate their own families or even with other people like uh, friendships. In their friendships or in their close circles, like they actually um, duplicate the dysfunctions. Why is that? It's because although they're physically outside their family, they're not free. They're still bound and um, they're not self-aware. Oftentimes, like they're not self-aware and that's why, why they're doing it. But the laws of God, the Word of God actually wakes us up like this is wrong. Look at it. This is wrong. Okay, and you just copied the dysfunctional behaviors, dynamics. Okay, come. Uh, look at this. This is what it's supposed to be. Look at the Word of God. This is what, what it's supposed to be. This is a healthy relationship. You see, there are uh, so many problems in this family, like say Jacob's family, right? You know, favorite sin and all that, right? Now, um, don't be like them, but, but be like this, you know? Uh, uh, look at this family. After dysfunctions have been uh, resolved, like Joseph's family, you know, uh, well, Joseph, not Joseph's family, but after everything was done, uh, toward the end of, uh, is it toward the end of Genesis, where um, Joseph actually um, becomes the prime minister of Egypt, and um, he wisely, wisely, strategically confronts his brothers, uh, help them come to aware of their sins, uh, that it's not okay, right? And they actually get to repent, right? And uh, while at the same time, he has forgiven them already, and so um, he has compassion toward them. That's why he went back into his, his room and started just weeping um, when, when he saw when, uh, their, his brothers um, in 13 years, so many years after, right? Now, um, look at this family, you know, this is what it's supposed to be, okay? Uh, why are there so many dysfunctions? Look at the uh, uh, book of Genesis, chapter 1 through 3, and what happened, see what happened. Now, uh, read um, the New Testament. It gives you ideas, like, why um, there, there's so much uh, evil, and how we can actually engage in spiritual battles and actually overcome, right? Uh, overcome the uh, evil with good. Now, um, so the laws of God sets us free. And therefore, God is saying, come on, listen to me. Do what it says so that you can be set free, so that you can receive blessings instead of cursing. Break the cycle of cursing and receive blessings. I want you to come away and hear and do, do what it says. Now, um, let's talk about chapter um, 8, technology and childhood education. Page 50, the importance of technology in child development. Digital media in the form of text 
graphics and video and audio, usually integrated and increasingly delivered over mobile devices, are ubiquitous in homes and schools. Yeah. These days, what happens is uh, when a baby, like, do, have you seen like a, a year and a half old babies or two year olds? They're not, um, they can't really form, formulate full sentences yet. They're just like, you know, uh, babbling and they're, you know, saying a few words maybe, but mama, daddy, you know, like hungry and something like that. But um, they are not able to actually, you know, communicate in length with any adults, right? Or um, even older children. But um, they're very apt. <laughs> they're very good at uh, just uh, using uh, tablets, right? Or iPhones or, you know, like, they're very skillful. They already obtained the skills to explore, uh, uh, you know, kind of navigate through the apps, different apps. <laughs> it's really surprising. Even before they are capable of uh, using, you know, spoons and forks properly yet, uh, they're, they're very good with um, tablets and, you know, electronics. Why is that? It's because uh, their generation is very different. When we, when I was born, I, I'm kind of a different generation too, but when I was born, uh, my mom probably, I, I, I can't remember, but I'm, um, I heard that she received flowers from her uh, nursing staff members and uh, uh, she probably had some food, right, and water, right, um, and she was surrounded by, by family, you know, my dad, my uh, brother and sister, right. However, um, <laughs> she did not have any electronics back then. Um, she probably did not have a radio, maybe, maybe she had a radio at best, uh, but probably people are not even using the radio that much. Now, uh, but then, these days, what happens is when a baby is born, uh, mom already has a phone, right? Uh, probably dad comes in and he actually records the moment of giving birth, right? And uh, actually, um, he takes the first pictures and then so through social media, he actually uh, sends it to everyone so that everyone knows, oh, a baby is born. Oh, um, his, she is like, oh, four pounds. <laughs> or, oh, you know, uh, she's a beautiful girl. Or like, oh, you know, like the, the mom looks really healthy afterwards, like things like that. So people instantaneously know what happened. And plus, when the baby, by the time the baby opens up uh, her eyes, for the first time, she sees mom and a cell phone. <laughs> um, and so then uh, what happens is like, even in, even while she's being breastfed, the mom sometimes gets distracted. You know, she, she does so much of phone. So one of the things that I noticed from um, talking with youth members is that, okay, so um, I told some of the people, um, some junior hires, I, I told them, Okay, so what do you do on weekends? Because I'm trying to kind of gauge where they're at in their family relationships, right? And so um, I sometimes ask them questions like, okay, so you guys, what do you do on weekends? And they're like, oh, well, eat and sleep, you know, and I'm like, okay, what else? You know, oh, you know what? Uh, we just uh, watch TV and, and I'm just asking like, oh, okay, as a family? And they're sometimes like, yeah, as a family, but other times they're like, no. You know, uh, we can do certain things. Like, so, so at your dinner table over the weekend. So your your parents are not working, right? And they're like, no, they're not working. So then, what do you talk about? And uh, they're like, um, we don't talk that much. We just eat, and we're on our phones. Like each person is on his or her phone. You know, I'm like, really? And your parents don't t say anything. Like, put away your phone and let's just eat and talk. And they're like. Our parents are on the phone. <laughs> My mom is on the phone. So um, we're so like exposed to electronic world and cyberspace. We're so used to it. And so even the uh, moms, you know, as they're their, uh, you know, raising their children, um, even from infanthood, they sometimes utilize tablets to 
keep them occupied or you know just uh, looking at their phone so much while the child is uh, uh, crawling around right and so uh, they're just it's like almost their second nature so I am um, hearing that uh, the network generation it's really hard for them to actually uh, uh, not keep looking at their phones or electronics because it has become almost like a second nature to them like it's like their arm <laughs> it's like their eye <laughs> and so they're so used to it they feel so connected and it's very difficult um, to to let that go to not do it so the digital media is like a must almost like a must right now the uh, the world is connected through the media so in the past um, it was like certain fashion um, actually uh, uh, makes a hit you know that certain fashion is really um, it, it becomes really popular now it starts in Paris usually it started in Paris and then um, afterwards they would have like fashion shows and they would send people over to do fashion hold fashion shows in other countries and you know uh, some of the western world and um, some of the asian countries would catch that and then like a few months later it becomes their fashion so it was like that but now because of electronics and social media people instantaneously actually record uh, you know fashion shows or anything like i'm just giving an illustration and actually it is instantaneously shared in the cyberspace and people from other countries get to see, oh, okay, this is what's going on. All right, let's do this. Like the same thing here. Um, say uh, some of the popular songs, okay? Um, say certain um, dance music or hip hop songs, uh, rap music, okay? They actually uh, started in one place. Say, um, say it started in the United States, but it instantaneously reaches uh, through YouTube and social media, um, certain parts of Af Africa, like a, all over the world instantaneously, right? Once you post something. Uh, it was really interesting during COVID, right? Uh, people actually posted cer uh, certain songs on YouTube and then it was shared and country by country, they started to sing the same song, right? Do you remember that? I wish I could actually show you that, but... Um, yeah, maybe I can share a link with you later, but um, yeah, so it's almost instantaneous. So for the, for the past few weeks, um, all the world, they started to actually sing the same songs. Now, um, so uh, we have become more intimate and narrower, um, although we're geographically apart. 83% of children aged 6 months to 6 years using screens every day for recreation, schoolwork, or uh, reading. Wow, 6 months. 6 months, can you imagine? Um, it's actually, I recommend, uh, based on research data, uh, to not allow your children to, your infants, to engage in um, electronics too much over a certain amount of hours at all. Uh, because it has become so problematic. Um, we have, have been seeing so much of physical developmental delays in today's children um, in early childhood. Yeah, speech delays. It, isn't it interesting? They're supposed to speak better because they're watching screens and they should be learning for some reason. Speech delays, their brain does not develop as fast. Um, they walk at a sl uh, later age. Um, they're just they don't have the manual dexterity because they've been just doing this, right? Um, they can't do any handicrafts. Um, their creativity level has dropped dramatically, and so I'm hearing from you know um, CEOs and you know managers, directors that these days if you hire new staff members that are just out of high school, that are just out of college then um, they're really not creative. Um, they just do what they're told to do and that's it. Like, they won't go any further. They won't um, actually exercise any creativity. And it starts from early age.
Okay, 83% of children aged six months to six years use every day, um, you know, electronics, some kind of technology. Okay, reading books with children is recognized as one of the most important contexts for language and literacy. So yeah, um, we can use ebooks, yeah, electronic materials to read with them. Um, we, we just have to understand that it has effect um, on their eyesight and even on their brains, probably, um, if you utilize um, uh, excessive amount of electronic um, books, ebooks, and e-sources. So, but anyway, um, reading books with children together, so, and it takes time, right? It takes time and effort. Um, it really helps them with literacy. Children find digital stories to be highly engaging, and many students report that they read more from screens than from paper. That has become true, right? Uh, we even watch the news and uh, check out the newspaper uh, online rather than like turning to the actual papers or actual books. The digital format includes features that are entertaining but potentially distracting. Yeah. So uh, there's a correlation, high correlation between how many hours uh, a child engages in electronics or cyberspace um, activities and how distracted he is or she is. Yeah. Very unfortunate. Um, some features included in ebooks are designed to make it possible for pre readers and early readers to enjoy books without adult guidance. Yeah. So they can actually, um, if you help them how to access, help them understand how to access these programs, then they can actually um, do it without parental help. However, there's much concern that the time children spend with digital media replaces opportunities for high quality social interaction with the adults. Yeah, it's more convenient for the mom, like, all right, here, all right, push the button, okay, turn the page, all right, in the next hour, like, I'm gonna do my own thing, you are uh, learning your language through that, okay? <laughs> it sounds really convenient uh, to help them uh, keep occupied. However, uh, there are downsides to doing that because uh, they're lacking the high quality interactions with adults. Um, it's detrimental to their social development and brain development. Understanding how children learn from digital media will support recommendations for the design, selection, and use of ebooks and educational apps for young children. So, so basically what, um, if you remember uh, from our previous chapters, um, social development and social interactions were closely related to brain development and even language development. Do you remember? It's because uh, we are made, we are designed to be social, to talk with other people, to converse with other people, to exchange ideas with other people. And when you are around your peers, you tend to have to, you know, communicate. Well, not just out of uh, need, but sometimes you just enjoy like. Uh, another human being is right next to you and so you tend to describe like look what I made or like do you like my car things like that they, they try to get each other's attention and therefore they tend to utilize more uh, language and therefore their verbal abilities and language abilities in general actually develop uh, quite quickly however if they're just given the electronics because uh, it's not necessarily interactive and even if you provide with them um, interactive programs communicating and interacting with uh, a robot or with uh, an AI or with uh, an electronic program is not just like interacting with human beings yeah research studies have been conducted regarding the impact of media on children's learning TV and video and you know primarily as well as children's learning from CD-ROM, web-based, and tablet applications, including ebooks, educational games. Like there are so many educational games that are so fun and uh, of high quality these days. And formal instructional technology designed for school use. Um, what they found out through this research study is that we need to limit access to screens during the first two years of life. First two years of life. Infants and toddlers do not generally learn vocabulary from videos and clearly learn best from exploring their surroundings and interacting with others. So even if you turn on TV, they're like, 
their jaws are dropping, they may be drooling even. <laughs> and it's really captivating, you know, all the like spectacular scenes, and especially with um, graphic design skills, it's incredible, like whatever they're watching. So it's like captivating, but for some reason their brain is not um, developing well, they're not interacting with human beings. And um, they, for some reason, they learn best by exploring their surroundings, not the electronics, but you know, like exploring the kitchens, exploring the living rooms, bedrooms, outside in, uh, you know, the nature, trees, you know, dogs, um, water. They actually learn better. Their brains develop better by doing that and interacting with people. Some studies indicate that excessive screen time in early childhood is associated with poor attention and self-regulation. Yeah, I think I told you that already, like, um, but basically um, their attention level drops and then uh, self-regulation that those people, those kids who are, have uh, games all the time, they tend to be uh, just uh, uh, hot tempered. They tend to be like, they don't have the patience. Um, Anything has to happen instantaneously, and uh, uh, they cannot really control their emotions very well. Yeah, I don't know how directly it is uh, related, but then they, they emo their emotional regulation is pretty, uh, it suffers, and it becomes a problem when they um, go finally go to school. It'll impact their adulthood, you know, when they have, uh, when they're placed in a social setting. Right, and uh, career setting would be a problem. Some studies indicate that, yeah, good quality ebooks and apps will be designed to support rather than replace social interaction. So uh, we can utilize, because since you know the uh, younger kids uh, really enjoy, uh, they, have, they have had much more exposure to electronics and technologies, so uh, they enjoy it very much, but then we cannot replace social interactions, human interactions with technology. Okay, Roman numeral two on the next page, how to help child um, develop and learn. Parents and teachers can support the child's learning by participating with the child in an interactive fashion. So when they engage in play, I think we already talked about this um, in social development and language development, right? Um, Parents can actually interact with the children without interfering too much or controlling too much. Talking about the story, asking questions, directing attention when necessary, and otherwise guiding and supporting, yeah, supporting the child's learning from the app. Special features built into ebooks are very engaging to children and have potential to enhance the child's attention to print. Yeah. However, these engaging features are not equally helpful for learning. Isn't that interesting? Multimedia features such as sound and video that's congruent with the story can deepen the child's understanding and of new words and story. Interactive features that distract the child from the flow of the story interfere with learning. So they're always downside. We have to really uh, make it the balance, good balance. So say the, the child is learning the vocabulary words. I don't know. Uh, oh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a duck. And then uh, the interactive media says, quack, quack. Um, and then it maybe it you know, gives you songs and everything. It is all uh, supplementary and it's helpful. But if you overuse it, then the child actually, it, it interferes with the child's learning. Wow, we need to keep that in mind. Not all so-called educational apps are equally helpful for children's learning. The apps should have clear learning goals, but the content should be presented in a meaningful context that actively engages the child and allows for creative exploration rather than mere rote learning. Some even features such as text and narration in multiple languages, recording functions, pop-up dictionaries, and apps to create personalized books may be especially helpful to prepare second language learners. Yeah, so there are, um, there are good purposes. Teachers and parents require explicit instruction to select and use digital media effectively with young children. So uh, with early child, uh, you know, K 
kids in early childhood uh, developing this stage, we have to be really careful, carefully expose them to digital media and um, e-learning or technologies. Yeah. Having said that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, all the knowledge and skills that we've obtained from. Thank you.